Okay, raise of hands in here. Uh, who remembers the old SNL skit, uh, Daily Affirmations with Stuart Smalley? It was the skit where a guy would start by like staring into a mirror and reminding himself uh, positive things. He would say things like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and then he would end with, doggone it, people like me. What about the movie The Help, the, the movie where uh, women would uh, raise young children in a small Mississippi town, um, and, and I specifically remember one character, her name was Abilene, um, and she would constantly tell the little girl that she raised uh, things like this, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. And, and it was just so sweet. There, there was especially a couple scenes where the, the mom was just this awful human being. And this woman would, would take the little girl and she would remind her who she was, the, the things that she spoke over her. Um, there's, there's another example. It's a little bit uh, less positive. Uh, it's from Toy Story 4, okay? Uh, and, and the uh, character Forky, remember what he constantly reminds himself? He's like, I'm trash, okay? And, and he doesn't even know that that's a negative thing. And Woody has to continually remind him, hey, no, 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 you're a toy. You're a toy. It's okay. Um, and, and so there's all sorts of things that we, we tell ourselves. There's all sorts of positive self-talk and negative self-talk. Um, and what I'm more concerned about is what does God tell us through Scripture? What does He remind us our identity is? Good morning. My name is Ben Till, and I'm the community pastor down at Bluffton. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. It's so good to see so many people that I recognize. And, and I was thinking before service, it's even cooler to see how many people I don't recognize. I, I've been here uh, off and on for the last several years, and there's so many new faces. So that's so exciting uh, as we continue to, to build the churches at Lighthouse in Bluffton. Um, if we've not met, I hope that we get to after service. Uh, I've got my coffee in me now, so I'll be a little bit more outgoing. Uh, and uh, would love to see you guys after service and, and, and connect with you guys. Uh, thanks to everybody who's joining us at Lighthouse Online. It's a nice rainy day out there, so it's a good day to cuddle up on the couch and watch us online. So thanks for joining us that way as well. We are in the second week uh, of our three-week series titled Identity, Who I Am in Christ. And, and this morning we'll be in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We read it during worship, um, but go ahead and flip there if you can uh, in whatever Bible or phone uh, that you brought uh, we're going to continue to focus on what the Bible says about who I am, and uh, again, thinking about in Christ uh, who I am. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth in Scripture. We thank you that, that you constantly remind us who we are. Lord, I, I thank you that, that you both shine a light on who we were outside of you and who we can be or who we are by placing our faith in you. Lord, help us to, to continually focus on that. Help us to see that rightly this morning. Um, Lord, I pray for uh, any words that come out of my mouth that, that are not from you, Lord, that you would just uh, put them on deaf ears and that you would, you would put words in my mouth uh, in place of anything that I may have prepared uh, that would speak truth to the, this group of people. And we're so thankful for who you are. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. And Lord, we, we thank you for being here with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, the passage, the, the version that I've got up on the screen is a little bit different uh, than, than what everybody else may have in their, their Bibles. As I was looking through, um, I tried to take a, a look at a bunch of different translations. And so 2 Corinthians 5.21 is very short. Um, and uh, it says, says the, the same thing in most of the translations, but I liked the way uh, the ESV said one part and the NLT said another part in the NIV. So I kind of melded them all together. Uh, we're calling this the BLT version because that's my initials. Uh, yeah, my parents named me after a sandwich. So thanks, mom and dad. Um, but this is what it says. It says, for our sake, God made Christ who had never sinned to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, our scripture this morning points to the second of three truths that we are focused on during this series. Uh, for those who have placed their faith in Christ, we can confidently say, I am righteous in Christ. And when I say those words, I am righteous, what's your gut reaction? 
Is anybody sitting there uh, doing what I sometimes do and, and saying that with a question mark on the end? Kind of like Ron Burgundy as he's reading the teleprompter and somebody accidentally put a, teleprompter, or a, a question mark on there uh, and you're saying, I am righteous? And you kind of got that like twang at the end of the, the sentence. Um, the unfortunate part is, is that sin does make us unrighteous. Isaiah 59.2 uh, said, In your iniquities uh, you have been separated. You are separated from God because of your sins, and God has hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. That is the unfortunate nature that we live in when we are outside of Christ. We are unrighteous. We are wicked. We are separated from God. This is true of everybody, um, but again, it's why those two words that go with I am righteous are so important. Those words in Christ. Without those words, it, it would be absolutely correct for us to read that statement with a question mark because it would not be true of us. When we are outside of Christ, we are the opposite of righteous. We are unrighteous. So what does it mean to be righteous? Uh, the word used in 2 Corinthians 5.21 refers to a right legal status. It's, it's the state of being righteous. Um, it's a status that satisfies the moral requirements of God's character. The Amplified Version, which always adds a little bit of extra commentary in it, says uh, that right the righteousness of God uh, is being made acceptable to him and being placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. So I want you to think of righteousness as uh, entering into a relationship with God based on his terms. Okay? And, and so with that in mind, we, we have to think about what are his terms? What, what are God's terms? How do I enter into a relationship uh, based on those. And so 1 Peter 1.6 says this. It says, Be holy as I am holy. And, and Peter is, is quoting several verses from the Old Testament here. Uh, lots of things from Leviticus when, when God is, is laying out uh, his law before the people. Okay? He, he's reminding them, hey, here's the law. Here are the rules. This is how uh, you achieve holiness. And He's not telling them then, but we know now that he's, he's giving them the law not because they're able to actually achieve righteousness through it. He's giving them the law so that we can see, they can see how sinful they were and how in need of a Savior they were. Jesus himself says very similar things. In, in Matthew 5, he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He goes on to say, that um, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. God's terms are to follow the law, the whole law, and nothing but the law. And again, we can't handle that. We cannot achieve that on our own, no matter how hard we try. This is evidenced in the way that Jesus continually reminded the Pharisees uh, hey, you're, you're not getting it. You're doing everything that you think you can on your own, and you're still not getting it. Uh, one story that it reminds me of is a conversation that Jesus has with a rich young ruler. Okay? Uh, this, this young guy comes up to him, he's got a lot of money, um, and he asks the question, uh, how do I inherit uh, eternal life? Essentially, he's saying, hey, how do I earn my way into heaven? What do I have to do? What rules do I have to follow? What standards do I have to live up to? And, and he kind of comes and uh, he, he uses flattery. And Jesus sees right through it, right? You ever done that before? You got a, like a really hard question to ask somebody. And you start with like, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. Hey, we should go out and get coffee. And like you just dance around the whole reason that you're actually talking to this person. And then at the end, you're like, oh, hey, by the way, my kid's selling popcorn. Uh, and uh, if you would uh, just donate money uh, to them, it's like... Yeah. It just totally uh, illegitimizes the entire conversation. So this guy kind of comes up and does that. He's talking to Jesus, and he's like, hey, man, I love your sandals. Uh, that tunic is super nice. Um, even though Jesus is like, yeah, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I know what you're doing. Uh, and he sees right through it. And he, 
he looks at the kid and he's like, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. And you know that I'm not, like you don't know that I'm God. So don't act like that you do. And, and so he kind of uh, goes through it. And he's like, but hey, to answer your question, here's how you earn eternal life. You follow the commandments. You follow the law. And so uh, the rich guy, it, it, he, I think he kind of puffs himself up and he's like, oh good, okay. Uh, I've done that my entire life. Uh, uh, which ones specifically are you talking about? And Jesus reminds him, all of them, okay? And, and again, he like doubles down and, and says like, oh, sweet, I've done that. And Jesus is like, hey, one more thing, one more thing. Hey, um, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything that you have and follow me. And at that, the poor kid puts his head down and walks away. He has no idea what that would look like. He has no idea what that would cost. And so, literally, Jesus is saying to the rich man in Matthew 19, 21, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything. Your treasure will be in heaven. Follow me. He then later talks to his disciples after they have watched this kid walk away. Um, and he says that with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The rich young ruler was relying on self-righteousness. He, he wanted to get to heaven on his own terms. He wanted to be able to say, hey, look at what I've done. Look at how good I am. And Jesus sees right to his heart. See, Jesus knows our hearts and he knows uh, when we're following the rules that we're not able to fulfill all righteousness because it's impossible for us to live up to God's standard of righteousness on our own. Some way, somehow, there is selfishness put in there. There, there is some sort of like false motivation put in there, even when we're doing all of the rules on our own. We, we, as we read that in the Sermon on the Mount, hey, you've heard it said, but I say. He takes it one step further and exposes the heart nature behind everybody. He's also exposing the fact that we need help. We need someone to help us with this. Isaiah 41 promises that God is our help, that Jesus himself is our help in several things. He says, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. See, the, the disciples, when they see this rich young ruler get sent away, they're like, they start freaking out. They're like, have we been following you, Jesus? And, and like, hey, I've been giving up like my house and my home, my family, all the things. And, and, and God in his word reminds us, do not fear, I will help you. And here's how he did it. He became sin. Our, our original passage uh, says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin. Okay? So, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean that Christ became sin? We, we know that Christ is God. So, how in the world could God become something that he hates the most? And, and so, uh, when you dive down into this, it's like one of those deep theological things that I don't know that we'll ever truly understand. Um, but what we do know is that Christ did not actually become sin itself. We do know that he did not become a sinner himself. And we do know that Christ did not become guilty of sin. All of those things would have disqualified him the way that we are disqualified. Okay? His sacrifice would not have been worthy to free us from sin if those things were true. Instead, what this means is that he took the place. He took the place of sin. He accepted the punishment. He accepted the condemnation and the guilt. And his scripture reminds us that he took on the curse because of our sin. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Why in the world would he do that? I know that I often ask that, and there may be people in this room who are asking that. 
And it's simply because He loved us. That's enough. It's enough that God loved us so much that He sent His Son to die on our behalf. So, is that it? Is that it? Uh, Well, kind of. Kind of yes, kind of no. Let's look back at at 2 Corinthians 5.21. Again, it says, For our sake, God made Christ who had never sinned to be sin for us, so that in Him we might we might become the righteousness of God. This is a theme that that we see in in other writings of Paul as well. Uh, He says, we too may live a new life. So uh, uh, So that the body of sin might be done away with. It's so important for us to understand this, that Christ's death has made new life, has made salvation, has made righteous, the righteousness of God available to us. But just because something is available doesn't mean that we'll actually take a hold of it. We have to receive this. Christ died once and for all, but the reality is that not all will submit to His saving grace and leadership in their lives. And so again, the question, why in the world wouldn't we? Well, Uh, It it might be because it seems too simple, right? We we think that it should be more difficult. We're we're kind of like the rich young ruler. We we want to know what do we have to do to earn this? What do we have to do to inherit this? Um, It has to be harder than just simply receiving it. But it's, it's, it's very clear in Scripture that faith saves us and faith makes us righteousness. We're going to roll through several verses here. Uh, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Habakkuk 2, 4 from a series not too long ago. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Romans 17 quotes that very verse. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that none can boast. That last part is so important. Righteousness is a free gift that comes from God when we believe so that we, we may not boast. Whether or not we're willing to admit it, we want the credit. We want to be able to say, I did that. Look at me. Look at how good I was. I've earned my way into heaven. I've inherited eternal life. This is why the Jews and many of us today still hold so tightly by earning righteousness by following the rules. Hey, uh, yeah, it's, it's by faith that we're saved and by being a good boy and girl, right? The fact of the matter is, God's saving grace is for everyone, as evidenced by the Gentiles who never even knew that the law existed in the first place. See, Jesus came not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Romans 3, 21 through 26 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood. To be received by faith, He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. We all sin. Therefore, we all need grace. We all fall short. Therefore, Christ takes our place. And by faith, we become the righteousness of God. 
when we attempt to, to achieve righteousness on our own, by our own merit, by following the rules, we just keep tripping and falling. You ever notice that? When you are trying to do this on your own, you just keep falling over yourself. You keep tripping and you don't know why. You feel like you're trying to do all the right things. You, tr- you feel like you're trying to, um, to, to be good and all of that. And it just keeps like, you just keep falling on your face. And the reason for that is because we're chasing an illusion that we could ever be good enough to satisfy God. The law was specifically designed to expose sin, not save us from it. Its purpose is to help us see how desperately we need a Savior. Romans 9, 30-33 says, What then shall we say, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Unfortunately, it is our pride that leads us to chase the illusion of control. We want to try to do it ourselves because then we can boast, we can, we can pull the attention on ourselves, we can get the adoration of others, and we can feel good about our moral uprightness and goodness. We can look in the mirror and say, doggone it, people like me, right? But it is by God's grace through faith that we are saved and made to be the righteousness of God. Guys, faith has that kind of power. Like, think about it. Faith heals the blind, right? Physically, back in Jesus' day and a couple of weeks ago when I was here, he, he heals the spiritual blindness of his people. He helps them to see him rightly. Faith restores the sick. Faith brings the dead back to life. And by faith, we are able to live in a right relationship with God. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says this, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. 1 John 1.9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Scripture says that we can offer every part of ourselves to him as slaves to righteousness and to let him use us as an instrument of righteousness. Think about that. God will use you as an instrument of righteousness. Not only does he declare you righteous, but then he promises to start using you to help. Okay? By helping, we we help share the gospel. We we help bring other people to, to an understanding of who Jesus is, not by by you know, doing good things or, or doing good works, but by reminding them constantly who I was and who I am now. In Christ, we are the righteousness of God. And so I want to finish with a couple questions. Are you in Christ? And the next question is, would you like to be? See, by offering ourselves up to Him, we are simply saying, here I am. You can have all of me. It's the one thing that the rich young ruler was unwilling to do. He was unwilling to offer himself up. He was unwilling to say, hey, all of this stuff matters not. I'm going to follow Jesus. And it's the one thing the disciples had done. We read all sorts of things about the disciples and the one thing that we come away with is like, these guys are probably the worst, <laughs> right? They keep making mistakes. Like, I think of like Peter and the fact that like he, he recognizes Jesus as Lord. He recognizes him as the Messiah. And then like three verses later, he turns around and is like, Jesus, no, you're never going to die. Like that's never going to happen to you. And what, you remember what Jesus looks at him and says? Get behind me, Satan. Okay? These guys had done nothing to earn this position except for 
faithfully follow. And that's what Jesus offers to us. Offer yourself up to him and say yes this morning. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to close this message the same way that we do each week with a question. Jesus, what are you saying to me right now? Lord, I thank you for the, the way that you have clearly displayed that it, it is by faith that we are saved, that it is by faith that we may become the righteousness of God, that you have offered that to us as a gift. And Lord, I, I confess on my behalf that there are so many times where I am trying to earn it. I'm trying to add something to the gospel and, and trying to, to make it make sense to me. Um, but Jesus, it's okay that it sometimes doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense why God would come to earth and die for me. Why God would come to earth and die for us. But that's exactly what happened. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room this morning, everyone who, who is in Christ but struggling with the fact that that is true, that they would be given a confidence to boldly say, in Christ, I am the righteousness of God. Because it's got nothing to do with anything they've done, and it's got everything to do with what you've done. And you've done it all. And Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who has not yet said yes to you, that this would be a morning where they would wrestle with that, that they would sense your Holy Spirit leading them to offer themselves up to you to be used as an instrument of righteousness. Lord, I thank you that you have offered that to every single person. And I thank you that it is by faith that we are saved. Amen. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to sing one more song like we do every single week. And we're going to pray. And if you want to pray, there are people who are uh, trained and ready to pray with you. They, they are actually eager to pray with you. Some of the sweetest times that I can remember at Lighthouse Community are right now, right here during this time of prayer. Larry talked about the 4 to 14 corridor, and I can remember sitting like right there. It was like the third week that I'd come to Lighthouse Community. <laughs> And I was struggling with why in the world am I an elementary principal? I was a high school football coach. I was a middle school teacher. Why, God, would you put me with kindergartners? Okay? It's just being honest. And Fritz was talking about the 4 to 14 corridor, and he was reminding us that, hey, this is where 80% of people come to faith. And right there in that seat, I broke. And I feel so bad for the prayer partner because I wept on her shoulder. But, but I knew... What, what God had made me for. Okay, now, obviously, that's changed, right? Uh, but this is a moment where you can be vulnerable, you can be transparent, and you can receive prayer. You don't have to be worried about that. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be someone who's been here. You can be here for the very first time. We all need it. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to, to go into this time. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw every person who needs prayer right now to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about Lighthouse Community, check out our website at mylighthousecommunity.com or connect with us on Facebook. You're invited to join us live Sunday mornings at 909 or 1111.